If you use Brighton Water, you are about to get a rather frightening note in the mail. The city wants you to read between the lines and not freak out. There's an investigation into allegations against a Northeast Colorado district attorney, and it made us realize there's no state law mandating how something like that gets investigated. He was brought in to fix a failing school. He did, then he left. Now they're bringing him back to fix it all over again. And it's Friday, so we hit the links to find your good news, because the only bad news on a golf course is a bad shot, right? If you live in the city of Brighton and use the water there, you are about to get a scary piece of mail. City officials sent notices to people living there today, alerting them that the city has violated state requirements that are in place to protect your drinking water. In the letter sent to residents, the city says it discovered the violation while reviewing its 2018 testing. Officials learned not enough of the backflow prevention devices had been tested. The state requires 70% must be tested to make sure drinking water is not contaminated. Brighton did not meet that number. The city's utility manager talked about it at this week's city council meeting. It was just something for some reason we had some devices that were duplicated in the system. Staff thought they were in compliance with the ratio of 70%. Upon further investigation, they identified they were not. They felt it to the responsibility of themselves to report that themselves to the Colorado Department of Health and Environment. There is no risk to the public at this time due to any contaminants in the system. We test the water on a regular basis. We have not had an issue with that water. We are going to be coming to council as part of this violation. We have to give the state notification as to what we intend to do to correct the deficiency. Now, if there was some sort of contamination, state officials would issue a boil water advisory. State health officials still recommend infants, the elderly, people with health concerns and pregnant women drink bottled water as a precaution. And Brighton has 90 days to resolve this issue. Now, the Brighton mayor is currently facing recall over the water there. Mayor Ken Kreitzer is accused of overcharging residents for water, then firing the city manager to cover it up. Mayor Kreitzer denies those allegations. He says firing the city manager was a personnel issue. Voters will decide on the recall in November. This week, Governor Jared Polis signed two executive orders, and he invited the media to watch both of them be signed. It's the one he signed last week that we just found out about that caught our attention. He ordered the attorney general to investigate one of the state's 22 district attorneys. Our Marshall Zellinger found it centers on a potential flaw in state law. Brittany Luton is the twice elected Republican district attorney in the 13th Judicial District, which covers Northeast Colorado. She's under investigation. No one involved is officially saying why. And what we just found out today is that state law really doesn't tell us what to do when we think an elected district attorney may have done something wrong. The case was investigated by the Colorado Bureau of Investigation and reviewed by a district attorney on the opposite side of the state. Matt Carson is an unaffiliated DA who was appointed to the job in July by Democratic Governor Jared Polis. In an executive order signed by Polis last week, he ordered Attorney General Phil Weiser to be special prosecutor to investigate Luton. The conduct of elected officials is a matter of statewide importance, he wrote. The governor therefore finds that it is necessary for the attorney general to act as the state's prosecutor and investigate and, where the evidence permits, prosecute potential criminal activity involving the elected district attorney for the 13th Judicial District. According to the Colorado District Attorney's Council, there is no state law for a situation where an elected district attorney is under investigation. Since the voters are her boss, unless they recall her, she can continue working as the DA. DAs can also lose their job by impeachment if they lose their license to practice or if they're convicted of a crime, Steve, that impacts their license to practice. So let's go back to this executive order. We heard the governor this week call for the attorney general or, or a special investigation into the shooting in Colorado Springs to take it out of the district attorney's mm -hmm. hands there. Why couldn't he do the same thing he's doing here in Colorado Springs? I don't know that he can't. I asked that. When I first saw this executive order, my first thought was, let's talk about Devon Bailey for a second. I asked, if you can do this in this case against the district attorney, could you do it in Devon Bailey? And it, it appears that you might be able to. The governor's office dodged the answer but said the governor has the discretion to decide the best course of action. It is a bit, a bit apples to oranges. We're investigating an elected leader versus pulling an investigation away from people who do this all the time. I can see that nuance, but if he has the power to do it in one, it seems logical you might have the power to do it in the other. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the case in the Springs and if he maybe makes a decision like that down the road. Marshall, thank you. 
A presidential candidate that wins the popular vote in Colorado won't necessarily get the electoral votes from our state. A U.S. Federal Court of Appeals ruling determined it's unconstitutional re to remove a faithless elector for not casting their vote for the candidate that gets the most votes in the state. Governor Jared Polis does not support that ruling. He spoke about it in a news conference this week where he said that old system of the Electoral College needs to go. Yeah, look, I think that this decision only highlights the need to abolish the archaic uh, electoral college. I mean, if we, uh, the voters of our state vote for somebody and we can't even make sure that that's who the electors vote for, it's clearly time to not have this archaic, undemocratic institution of electors and just move to direct popular vote of presidents. Governor Polis signed the national popular vote bill into law that would give Colorado's electoral votes to the person that wins the national popular vote. A group wanting to repeal that new law has turned in signatures to put this law up to the voters in November. The Secretary of State still has another week to certify all of those petition signatures. More mountain lions are being spotted around Bailey in the same area where an eight-year-old boy was attacked by one of the animals. Five mountain lions have been seen out there Three of them have been seen on trail cameras in the area. Two were euthanized by Colorado Parks and Wildlife yesterday after killing a goat. They believe one of them was the animal that attacked the boy. A lab in Wyoming will do a DNA analysis to confirm that. Our next question comes from one of our own producers, Kevin. He wants to know why a lab in Wyoming is doing the DNA testing of the mountain lions that were euthanized after the attack in Bailey. The answer is simple enough. Colorado Parks and Wildlife says they have a health lab here that can conduct the necropsy of the animal, but it doesn't have the equipment necessary for a DNA analysis. The forensic lab out in Wyoming is capable of doing that, so they send the samples out there. At Lincoln High School in Southwest Denver, what's old is new again. The school started to have the same problems it did about 15 years ago. So what did the district decide to do? Bring back the man who fixed it the first time. Our Nelson Garcia explains. There was a hole again at Lincoln High School in Southwest Denver, a hole left by former principal Antonio Esquibel. Yeah, this is a, um, a present that was given to me uh, when I left in 2011, and what it says here is Lancer for Life, 1985 to infinity. It was interesting because I thought, you know, really, what does that infinity mean? When he took over in 2006. You know, I'm an Abraham Lincoln High School graduate. I grew up in this neighborhood. Lincoln was failing with low test scores and low enrollment. And so when we started talking about our plan, you know, there were a lot of doubters. Within five years, his high expectations, college culture, and rigor paid off. But students want to have that... Uh, that tough love. Graduation rates improved as much as 12% each year. Test scores jumped and enrollment swelled over 1,900. Networks uh, of our schools. Lincoln was celebrated as a Denver success story that reached national attention under Esquibel. I mean, there was a reason why President Obama visited Lincoln. It was because some of the amazing things we were doing. He became a part of history. And to try to capture a little flair of what the community looks like in Southwest Denver. His likeness is in the neighborhood mural and his portrait hangs in the hall of former Lincoln principals. I'm not gonna put two pictures up there, that, that'd be crazy. He was promoted from Lincoln and worked for years in the district office solving big picture problems, leaving that hole in a place that started to turn bad again. You know, I think one of the challenges has been uh, enrollment. Uh, you know, there's around a thousand less kids here today than there were uh, eight years ago. Now he's back to repeat his success. I think we're gonna have to be smarter and more innovative the second time around and make Lincoln High School whole again. I think at the end of the day, this is really my role. For next, I'm Nelson Garcia. Escobel plans to reinvent Lincoln with more offerings to help students be career ready as well as college ready. He says this time he plans to retire as principal. Only 10 Democrats will be on the stage for the third debate being hosted by ABC. So Senator Michael Bennett is not one of them. He's not too happy about that. So he pulled one of his most recent Bennett moves and he got angry about the whole thing. He made sure the Democratic National Committee knew at the party's summer meeting in San Francisco today. Uh, Bennett was loud and clear about how he believes this system isn't working using Washington Governor Jay Inslee as an example. Inslee, the self-proclaimed climate candidate, dropped out of the race Wednesday after not qualifying for the debate in a climate event. Think about that for a moment. 
The climate change candidate didn't qualify for the climate change town hall. If we wanted to be the party that excluded people, we'd be Republicans. So these are the 10 candidates who have qualified for the debate so far. This round required them to have at least four polls showing them at 2% support and at least 130,000 unique donors. Senator Bennett will be campaigning in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Nevada next month. A fire burning in the Amazon rainforest is getting even more help from Colorado. The world's largest firefighting plane left its home here to go help fight the flames in South America. The most Colorado thing we've seen today is a woman doing the right thing around our wildlife, but some animals are just too nosy. Next. The world's largest firefighting aircraft that calls Colorado home is now taking on one of its biggest missions yet. Today, the 747 Global Super Tanker arrived in South America to help battle fires in the Amazon rainforest. This is the video of the Colorado Springs based plane when it was first introduced in 2016. The aircraft can carry nearly 20,000 gallons of fire retardant. Right now, it's fighting fires in the part of the Amazon that stretches through Bolivia. It's what just one that? of the areas where thousands of fires continue to destroy the rainforest known as Earth's lungs because the Amazon produces 20% of the oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> No fires around here. The biggest threat we've seen strong thunderstorms moving in just on the eastern side of the metro area out towards Byers, Bennett, Strasburg, Kim Bailey capturing this video of a hailstorm pushing in in the backyard. A hail just looking like ping pong balls out there. You can see about a, a two inches, two and a half inches or so in diameter. Very impressive. And tonight we're still watching these severe thunderstorms track across the eastern plains. The severe thunderstorm watch in blue until 10 p.m. And then the flash flood watch going in parts of Nebraska. Kansas and just a little sliver of eastern Colorado because some of these storms, once they make their way across the eastern side of the state, they will be packed with so much water and we could see one, two, three inches of rain coming through. Severe thunderstorm warning going in Weld County.
cloudy until about 6:30. A lot of lightning with this one. More than 300 strikes just to the north of Greeley, as well as half dollar sized hail. We've seen quite a bit of action going across the eastern plains too. Tonight, partly cloudy skies here in the metro area will fall to about 55. We'll keep it mild in eastern Colorado, but those numbers up in the high country beginning to cool off quite a bit at night. This is all that rain I was talking to you about about 10 o'clock or so. They're just getting hammered with storms overnight. It pushes out a little bit of fog to wake up to across the northeastern plains, but sunshine here in the metro area across the state looking beautiful. Maybe one or two isolated storms across the extreme eastern side of Colorado tomorrow afternoon, but the heat rolls on and so does the sunshine. We're back to the 90s here in Denver, 70s, 80s up in the high country. Hotter on Sunday, but a cool off coming our way early next week. Look at that nice break, Danielle. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The most Colorado thing we've seen today is a curious animal up on Mount Evans. Kathy Gonder and her husband were driving up to the summit of Mount Evans for the first time when they saw a group of bighorn sheep. One of the ewes walked right up to Kathy's window. She immediately started taking pictures. The ewe seemed to be into it because she stood right there, posed for Kathy. What's the most Colorado thing you've seen? Share it with us using the hashtag HeyNext or email next at 9news.com. After 127 years, a local daily paper is losing all of its staff. While it's sticking around, it's still a blow to the print industry in Boulder. We like to end our Fridays on a good note. I'm happy every time I come to work. So I get a, yeah, I work on a golf course and I serve beverages and snacks to people. We might not all share the same good news, but we love to hear yours next. keeps getting tougher for print media. A newspaper in Boulder that has been around for 127 years is losing the last members of its small staff. Starting Monday, the Colorado Daily will no longer have a dedicated staff. The paper started as a student newspaper on the CU Boulder campus back in 1892. In 1971, it moved off campus and became a, an independent daily paper. Over the years, it's continued to downsize. Now its staff roster is zero. 
Ariel Peel, a former Nine News producer who now works for NBC in New York, used to work for The Daily after graduating from Boulder High School. She says The Daily was the first to take a chance on her, and she still remembers the first story she was able to pitch to the editor-in-chief. He looked at me and he looked around the newsroom and he said, look who found some news. And he said it in front of all the other journalists there. And I will never forget that moment because that was the first time I, I felt like a real journalist. And I think those experiences with local newspapers are so important to communities and they're so important to young journalists. And I think the announcement today is really heartbreaking because I think about young people who won't get to have the same experience that I did, won't get to have those opportunities. And I think that that's, that's really challenging to build strong journalists when at a local community level, you don't have that base that in a lot of cases, we've been really lucky to have for a very long time. Employees at other local papers in the Boulder area will now take on the task of putting together the Colorado Daily. Hey, may I make a recommendation? Okay, this time this is absolutely self-serving. We just made a podcast. It's called From the Cheap Seats, an Avs fan podcast from Nine News. Our graphics guy, Geoff Sautel, Jeff to some, and I host this weekly. Uh, so we're both season ticket holders for the Avs. We sit pretty darn close to the ceiling of Pepsi Center, hence the name of the podcast. Each week, we feature guests like fans and people who you may not know at Pepsi Center. Our first guest is a next favorite, Mark Castellano. He's the Pepsi Center organist, and he actually played live in studio for our first episode. I tweeted out a link earlier today, but it'll be available on iTunes soon. The Nine News app got a shiny new makeover recently. We know your phone screen is full of alerts. Your college roommate tags you in a Facebook meme or your missed call from your mom. But you can also sign up to get next push alerts for the stories we are working on. Just open up your app, tap on the gear in the top right corner. Under the notification settings, you'll see a section called Topics, where you can turn on Nine News Alert for any topic you want, including next with Kyle Clark. And if you don't have the app yet, look for Nine News in your app store. It really is a cool app, and I'm not just saying that because my job depends on it. So we were chatting today about what push, push alerts we could send out. We probably would want to avoid pictures of cars parked across two spaces and dogs wearing goggles. And you probably don't want your updates clogged with, uh, with updates to the countdown to RTD's long-awaited Longmont train, you know, the one launching in 2050, which, by the way, is now 11,090 days away.
You'll always find good news on a golf course. So let's go to Fox Hollow in Lakewood. The good news is we have some friends of ours uh, in from out of town uh, that we haven't seen for quite a while and uh, spending some nice quality time with them. And good news. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I'm happy every time I come to work. Really? I get a, yeah, I work on a golf course and I serve beverages and snacks to people. People are happy to see me. So, yeah, every day out here is a good day. So that's my good news. Uh, the health and happiness of my family is all in a good spot right now. So. I think that's good news. My grandfather, my only living grandparent, he just turned 98 last week, so that's awesome. Yeah, good genetics. He's doing well. <laughs> Taught me to golf, so that's good. Happy about uh, being able to be out in the open like this and not fighting any traffic and wide open space, no houses here, and uh, a great game of golf. Being able to play golf out here whenever I feel like it. Well, retired 17, 19 years ago, and I've been working here ever since. Yeah. So this is, this is the good life. Yeah, golf course on Friday is not a bad thing. It doesn't get any better than that. And a beautiful golf course it is. Uh, good news from some folks out there. Jeremy says, our little girl stood for the first time after a long recovery from her liver transplant. How about that, Jeremy? That's the best news we could hear today. We'll see you next time.